Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Feel free to keep coming in and, and find a seat. Um, again, we'd like to thank you all for uh, for showing up to the third lecture in the series. We're we're after tonight halfway halfway there, um, and uh, so we just appreciate you coming. We appreciate your continued support um, of this event. Um, again, would like to thank the Politics and Government Department for their support as well as. Um, the communications department um, for for supporting this event and helping us to to market this event so that people could could uh, find out about it and could show up here um, like you all did tonight. Um, so we thank you again for being here. Um, just to introduce ourselves briefly, my name is Dr. Michael Artime. Um, I help coach debate here, and I'm an adjunct instructor at um, Tacoma Community College. Um, and I'm Mike Purdy. I'm a Seattle-based consultant and presidential historian. I've got a website, presidentialhistory.com, with uh, lots of resources about the 2016 election. I've got a blog. There's videos there. Uh, you can sign up for a free email subscription to the blog if that is something you are interested in. Um, and we would encourage you to uh, to get involved with us outside of this space as well. So um, you can go to presidentialhistory.com and you can go to uh, the resources section of that website and you can find the videos of all of these lectures. So um, if you want to watch them over and over and over again and share them with all of those that you care about or um, give them as gifts uh, to your family members, then you're welcome to do so. Um, also, you can uh, follow us on Twitter at WH Campaign, White House Campaign. Um, that is the hashtag, and you can uh, talk to us about um, whatever you think is interesting um, in, in terms of this, this election season. So we would encourage you uh, to get involved in all of those different ways. Okay, well we have, uh, for the last two sessions, I've uh, promised and I've said that we're going to talk about this uh, long and dishonorable tradition of presidential insults. So some come from campaigns and some come from just presidents sniping against uh, other people who have held the office of president. So a little quiz time. Who is unhinged? Who said that? This is current election. Say again. So Jeb Bush said that about Donald Trump, but, you know, Donald Trump kind of got in the act and he saw that's a good term. <laughs> and, and so he's used that against Ted Cruz. Maybe there's been others who have picked that up too. Um, th this one comes from history. Uh, no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. Um, so this was actually not during a campaign, but this is from one of our more colorful presidents. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said it about William McKinley, no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. And then also from history, this goes back, um, an active but shallow mind. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could apply that today. Um, <laughs> so that was uh, John Adams speaking about William Henry Harrison. And then finally, dumb as a rock. <laughs> who said that? And who was it about? So that was Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, Trump, Trump is good for you know, some things. I actually, you know, we kind of have a shortage of trying to find some of these terms right now. Huh? So um, he said that about Jeb Bush. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about what the candidates believe. So if you remember last time, we talked about uh, kind of some soft issues about um, candidates, some characteristics. We looked at their experience. We looked at their temperament. We looked at rhetoric. We looked at their age and their health. And, and we said that those are some of the filters that we need to look at when we're evaluating candidates. Uh, what we did not talk about was the candidate's position on policy issues. So we've selected a couple of policy issues that we're going to talk about tonight. And, but before we get to that, we're going to talk about uh, faith and religion and what have presidents in the past believed. And we're going to look at um, some statements from some of the current candidates and think about that. But before we get to all of that, we're going to end up talking about uh, the candidates right now, the candidates who are left in the race, and we'll talk about what 
has transpired since we last met in terms of uh, caucuses and primaries. So that's kind of our agenda tonight. Next time, March 24th, we're going to talk about uh, the voters, what voters and what uh, states are going to be key and influential in electing the next president. We'll talk about the Electoral College uh, next time as well. So who is left on the Republican side? Well, uh, Jeb Bush dropped out after South Carolina, a fairly dismal showing there. And then Ben Carson dropped out after Super Tuesday. So we're left with four candidates, uh, two very anti-establishment candidates. So Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. Um, and, and so when you look at um, these anti-establishment candidates, you know, some uh, people in the establishment are not happy with that. Uh, it led Senator Lindsey Graham to say in terms of picking between Trump and Cruz, it's like whether you want to get shot or poisoned. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it's interesting, this mood of uh, anti-establishment that has come up. And in some ways, you, you, know, you talk to voters, you listen to voters in these states who are voting for some of these anti-establishment candidates. And they say one of the reasons they're doing it is they're mad at Washington. They're angry at Washington and the gridlock and that nothing has happened. So I think in some ways the Republican Party itself is, may have some blame here in terms of the, uh, these anti-establishment candidates coming up. When Barack Obama was elected president, uh, Republicans in Congress got together and they said uh, they were going to block everything that he wanted to accomplish, um, whether they agreed with it or not, just to be obstructionist. So we've had seven years of gridlock, and, and this is what some of these Republican uh, voters are now saying. We're tired of the gridlock. We want to get rid of that. And so uh, that's partly where the, the party has contributed to the rise of this anti-establishment mood. And then the other thing, of course, that's contributed to it is the, um, some of the rules that the Republican Party has come up with for the primaries and caucuses. Um, the, uh, having a lot of winner-take-all states, so we're going to start to see winner-take-all states next Tuesday. Uh, and Michael's going to talk about that a lot more in a few minutes. And uh, the Republicans also have established minimum percentage thresholds that a candidate must meet in certain states before they can even uh, get delegates. And so that's knocked out uh, some delegates. What that does is that makes it for a plurality candidate, a candidate who doesn't get a majority to, um, in a winner-take-all state, to win all those delegates and to possibly win. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what might happen in terms of a brokered convention. Uh, Michael's also going to talk a little bit more about um, you know, what's going to happen next Tuesday, but I think it's fair to say that it's going to be a pretty critical race for um, Marco Rubio in Florida and John Kasich in Ohio. So that's the Republicans. Democrats, no change. Okay, Still have Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders battling it out. Independent candidate. We talked last time about uh, Michael Bloomberg, former New York City mayor, was contemplating a run uh, as an independent candidate. And he just recently announced that he would not do it. And he said he wouldn't do it because he wasn't convinced that he could win a majority in the Electoral College. He was concerned that nobody might win a majority in the Electoral College. So if nobody wins a majority there, then the election goes to the House of Representatives where each state delegation has one vote. House of Representatives at this point and probably in the future will be controlled by Republicans. So Bloomberg's fear was that that would end up electing Donald Trump and that was something that he wasn't willing to do. But just to keep things exciting, Bloomberg's kind of out of the picture, but you know, we might have... <laughs> we might have Jesse Ventura, a uh, former governor of uh, Minnesota, has talked about, he has said that if Sanders does not get the Democratic nomination, that uh, he is going to run on the Libertarian ticket, or he's going to try to get the Libertarian nomination. He's got to fight with Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico, for that. 
Um, so that would be very interesting to see that. It'd be interesting to see Trump on the stage with Ventura and, yeah, so. <laughs> There's also some other possibilities that might happen. So um, if we have a brokered convention for the GOP and nobody gets a majority of uh, delegates, 1,237 delegates on the first ballot, then the delegates become unbound or uncommitted on the second and subsequent ballots. There's kind of a, a tiered structure of when they become uh, uncommitted. There is a super PAC that has been started to draft Paul Ryan. So he is a possibility that um, maybe in a brokered convention he might uh, come out as the nominee. Uh, Mitt Romney recently came out with a, a 20, 25 minute talk uh, really trying to take down Donald Trump and being very critical of Trump. Um, and so he could also be um, uh, the nominee. And there's also been talk within the Republican Party of starting a new party to um, have a more establishment candidate. And either one of these gentlemen could be um, a possibility for that if that should happen. So it could get more exciting, though, too, because uh, we, we, we could have this man as an independent candidate. He, is, he has said that he is not going to run as an independent. Um, but if he is denied the nomination, it's a brokered convention and he doesn't get the nomination, then uh, all bets are off. Uh, now, he would have a big challenge, I think, because he would have to um, try to get on the ballot in all of the states, and that would be pretty late. So the convention is late July, starts July 18th. And so he would have a big challenge to get on the ballot in all of the states. If we had any uh, number of these scenarios with uh, third party or independent candidacies, uh, this could end up meaning that no candidate wins a majority in the Electoral College, which would throw it into the House of Representatives. And we'll talk about that a lot more next week. We'll look at what's happened historically uh, next time on March 24th. So Michael, tell us what the candidates need to do to win the nomination. Well, they have to win. So um, that, is, that is the most important thing. If we look at where things stand right now, uh, on the Republican side, Donald Trump has 458 um, delegates. Uh, Cruz has 359, Rubio 151, Kasich 54, and Carson, who recently dropped out with, with eight. You need 1,237 uh, delegates in order to win the nomination. And we're going to see... Uh, uh, we're going to see candidates um, start to accumulate uh, delegates um, at a greater speed in the upcoming weeks as we move into winner-take-all states where uh, things aren't, where the delegates aren't divided up proportionally. On the Democratic side, um, right now, in terms of pledged delegates, Clinton has a 745 to 540 uh, lead, so about a 200 um, delegate lead. Um, if you add in her super delegates, um, that lead becomes much larger. So she has uh, 461 super delegates to Bernie's uh, 25, um, which puts her at a total of 1,221 delegates um, to 571 um, delegates. On the Democratic side, you need 2,382 uh, 2, delegates to, uh, to win the nomination. It's important to note that super delegates are uh, super delegates are not bound, meaning that they are free to change their mind um, if they choose to do so. Um, so, for example, if Bernie Sanders started doing really well and started sweeping lots of states, then there is the potential, or at least the campaign tells you that um, it would be likely that these super delegates would jump ship um, from Hillary Clinton and join uh, join up with his campaign um, as they did in 2008 with Obama. I think that um, I think. You know, I'm a little reluctant to say that that would definitely happen. I think that Obama was certainly a more mainstream Democratic candidate um, than Bernie Sanders, so I think that it might uh, take a little bit more than a streak of victories in order to get those superdelegates to, to start to jump ship um, from the Clinton campaign. Uh, March 15th is really important. Okay? Um, it is important for, uh, for candidates uh, on both uh, the Republican side and the Democratic side. 
Um, so if we look, uh, if we look at this first uh, from the Republican side, um, as of now, um, Trump needs to win about 56% of the remaining delegates. Um, so his next closest rival is Cruz, who would have to win 63% of the remaining delegates in order to win uh, the party's nomination. So, um, so it doesn't appear real likely that anyone is going to be able to accumulate the delegates necessary to overtake Trump um, before we would get to a brokered convention situation. Um, so there's a couple different scenarios, or, or four different scenarios that I'd like to talk about for, uh, for March 15th. The first scenario is that Trump wins Ohio and Florida. Ohio and Florida, uh, Ohio and Florida are the two biggest states that night. Those are the states that you should be paying attention to. If Trump wins uh, both of those states, he only has to win 50% of the remaining delegates in order to win the nomination. If Trump uh, loses both, um, that's when things get really interesting. So then he would have to win 64% of the remaining delegates, which would be incredibly difficult um, for him to do. And so if, if he loses both Ohio and Florida, so if Ohio votes for Kasich, if Florida votes for Rubio, then we are in all likelihood going to end up um, with a contested convention. Um, if Trump wins Florida but loses Ohio to Kasich, then um, Trump is still going to need 56% of the delegates. If Trump wins Ohio but loses Florida, he would need 58% of the delegates. And this assumes a scenario in which Ted Cruz does not win, um, does not win either Ohio or Florida. And so I think that's a fairly you know, reasonable projection. Um, if that's the case, uh, regardless of what, uh, what else happens that night, Cruz would need 72% of the remaining delegates in order to win the Republican nomination. So I think either way, after March, uh, March 15th, it's Trump or uh, contested convention. And so March 15th is an incredibly important night. You should be, you should be paying attention to that. Um, if we look at uh, 538.com, Nate Silver, some of you may have heard of him, uh, his site does uh, you know, does a lot of statistical analysis related to the election. Um, they created um, they created targets um, for each of the candidates um, in the election cycle. So they said if if a candidate was going to win the nomination, then they should have this number of delegates at this time during the election cycle. Uh, Trump right now as is at 106 percent of his target, so he is beating his projections. Uh, Ted Cruz is only at 69 percent of his target, so he is behind his projection, and Marco Rubio is only at 41% of, of, uh, of his projection right now. If we look at the Democratic side, um, Hillary Clinton is at 113% of her projection, so she is beating her projection. Sanders is not, uh, is not beating uh, his projection right now. Um, and so uh, Hillary Clinton is about, has won about 32.2% of the delegates that she would need in order to win, uh, win the nomination. Um, this is going to be, you know, it might not seem like there's a, there's a big difference in terms of the delegates, um, but it's really difficult for Sanders to catch up um, because, he, because all of the Democratic states um, are proportional. They, they allocate their delegates proportionally. There are no winner-take-all states, uh, meaning that, you know, he had, a, he had arguably, you know, one of the best nights of his campaign so far when he uh, won Michigan. Um, but still picked up very few delegates over Hillary Clinton in Michigan and lost big in Mississippi and ended up losing the night in terms of delegates. And so it doesn't matter how many states you win. It, man it matters how many delegates um, you win. Um, I was looking at a recent projection um, on what Bernie Sanders would have to do in order to win the nomination. They say that he would have to win 53% um, of the vote in the big six states, so California, New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, and Ohio. Um, he would need landslide victories in um, states where the population was 70% or more white, and he would need to win states where the majority of the population was non-white, um, or he wouldn't need to win, he would need to get at least 48% of the vote in those states, and he's been getting wiped out um, in those states uh, so far. So, you know, it, it doesn't look good if you're looking, if you're looking at the math. That being said, 
Um, he raised $5 million after winning Michigan the other night. He has a lot of money. He's saying he's going to move on to the convention. And things aren't a cakewalk for Hillary Clinton either. She has to win 58% of the remaining delegates in order to win the nomination. And um, she's going to have to pick up at least another 200 plus uh, super delegates, even if you uh, take that more conservative 58% uh, marker. Um, so up to this point on the Democratic side, 56% of the delegates have been awarded, um, or at the end of this month, 56% of the delegates will have been awarded. Republicans will have awarded 64%, and so this is this is a big month. Um, so we should be we should be paying attention to all of these all of these races. Uh, so that's uh, an update of where we're at right now in terms of the election on both sides. Now I'm going to turn things over to Mike, who's going to introduce us to. Uh, our first topic this evening, which is the, the faith of presidents. Thank you, Michael. So we want to talk about um, presidential faith. Uh, we're going to look at uh, what uh, presidents in the past, what's their, been their faith, their religion, and we want to look also at some of the candidates. And we want to think about kind of what's the interplay with their faith and uh, their policies, and think about how their, um, their faith impacts what kind of voters they get, who they're going after. So if we look historically, um, all of our presidents have had some kind of religion, all Christian, different denominations, um, except for Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, who were not affiliated with any particular denomination. And so I want to talk about those two in particular. Um, so we could kind of divide what we're going to talk about into a, a couple of categories. One is kind of the mainstream denominations, which are most of the presidents, and we're not going to talk about those. I want to talk about these two unaffiliated presidents, Jefferson and Lincoln. And then I want to talk about uh, John F. Kennedy as the first Catholic president and some issues that came up there. And then finally, we want to look at... Uh, the nature of evangelicals and Jimmy Carter. So we'll think about that. And then we'll look at the current candidates. So Thomas Jefferson, would he get elected today? Don't know. It's really interesting. Jefferson had some very unorthodox Christian beliefs. I mean, he believed in God, um, but he said he was a sect unto himself. And um, and so he had his own ideas. Uh, he didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. Uh, he did not believe in miracles. Now it's interesting if we look at some of the candidates today. Um, so Donald Trump um, says he's a Presbyterian. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. Um, but uh, fairly non-religious. And Bernie Sanders uh, is a secular Jew. And, and where his faith is in God is a little bit uncertain. Um, so in the past, voters have gone to candidates like Jefferson who didn't have this solid faith. In fact, because Jefferson uh, did not believe in miracles, he didn't believe in the miracles that Jesus performed, uh, he took his New Testament and scissors and he cut out all of the miracles. And so he created what, what has become known as the Jefferson Bible, which is the New Testament without any miracles of Jesus. Um, so he was uh, pretty viciously attacked in the 1800 campaign. Uh, he was called a howling atheist, was one of the charges. And, and then another thing, I'll, I'll read this to you because it's, it's kind of hard with uh, some of the language and uh, the image. So. At the present solemn and momentous epoch, the only question to be asked by every American laying his hand on his heart is, shall I continue in allegiance to God and a religious president or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God? So that was part of the campaign against Jefferson in 1800. Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's wife said that he was not a technical Christian. Uh, Lincoln never uh, joined a church. He did attend uh, church services as president. Um, particularly in his younger years, he was very skeptical of Christianity. But I think we saw that during the Civil War, his faith really deepened. Um, I think just because of some of the burdens that he faced 
And um, so if you look at his speeches and his proclamations, they're, they, they're laden with a lot of religious and spiritual uh, terminology. Um, he prayed. Uh, you've got this quote from him about praying. I've been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. So I think Lincoln definitely grew in his faith, and I think Lincoln's faith, however you want to characterize it, did impact um, his policies and how he acted. So in uh, 1865, when he gave his second inaugural address, he ended up, um, and I want to read this to you, because I think it's really significant how spiritual this is, how biblical this is. And that's actually a picture of Lincoln uh, in the circle there giving his second inaugural address. So he says, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So what do we get out of that? So um, forgiveness, healing, grace, um, is compassionate, uh, is caring for the widow and the orphan, peace, so all very biblical themes that he weaves into his addresses and his proclamations. So I want to think about what I call the Catholic problem. And, and, and this is going to be important too a little bit later on as we talk about immigration. So in 1928, Al Smith ran on the Democratic ticket for president. He was wiped out in that election. Uh, he was a Catholic. Uh, he only ended up getting uh, 70, 87 electoral votes uh, to 444 for Herbert Hoover. And so I think the country was not ready for a Catholic at that point, and that was a big issue. Um, so then we go up to 1960, and Kennedy is running on the Democratic nomination. His Catholicism was still a big issue, and, and many people were concerned, so is he going to get um, his instructions from the Pope? Um, so some people were concerned about it. Actually, some people weren't concerned about it. Uh, some people were more concerned about uh, Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, and his, his influence on uh, John F. Kennedy and his money, uh, which prompted uh, former President Truman to say, it's not the Pope I worry about, it's the Pop. <laughs> but there was this undercurrent of uh, tension about Kennedy and his Catholicism. So he decided in the 1960 election to confront this head on. He gave a speech in September 1960 to the uh, Greater Houston Ministerial Association, a bunch of pastors, and he hit it head on. And, and there's a couple of quotes that I want to read you from that because I think those quotes are very, very relevant to what we're seeing today um, in today's environment. So Kennedy says, I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope or any other ecclesiastical source. So here he is, he's uh, responding to the direct criticism that, you know, he's just going to be a puppet of the Pope. Um, He's saying, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and, and this is really important, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. We can kind of think about our current environment and uh, some statements about uh, shutting down mosques and things like that. Kennedy continues, for while in this year it may be a Catholic against whom the finger of suspicion is pointed, in other years it has been and may someday be again a Jew or a Quaker or a Unitarian or a Baptist or we could add or a Muslim. Today I may be the victim, 
but tomorrow it may be you. I would not look with favor upon a president working to subvert the First Amendment's guarantees of religious liberty. And neither do I look with favor upon those who would work to subvert Article 6 of the Constitution, which says that there's no religious test for anybody to be uh, a, a public official in Congress or the president. Um, by requiring a religious test, even by indirection, for if they disagree with that safeguard, they should be openly working to repeal it. So we've heard things in this campaign from Ben Carson about, no, I don't think a Muslim could or should ever be president. So I think Kennedy's words are very good uh, words that speak to today as well. And this speech is uh, credited in many ways with putting to rest the concerns about Kennedy's Catholicism. 1976, Jimmy Carter bursts on the scene from Georgia, an unknown Georgia governor, former governor. Uh, he says he is born again, and people say, what is that? So Time Magazine says 1976 is the year of the evangelical. So Carter was one of the most um, personally and privately religious presidents that we've had. And yet, interestingly, because he believed so much in separation of church and state, his public pronouncements uh, don't talk a lot about religion. Uh, he, his faith did inform his actions, however, for instance, his um, emphasis on human rights. So that comes out of Carter's deep faith. But because Carter didn't speak the Christian language, so evangelicals supported him in 1976, but he didn't speak the Christian faith. 1980, Ronald Reagan shows up. He speaks the Christian faith. He introduces the term, God bless America. And that becomes a, a common uh, phrase that we hear now at the end of most political speeches. Uh, Reagan introduced that. Um, but, but evangelical voters were um, uh, very disenchanted with Carter because he did not implement their social agenda. So what we have happening is, you know, we, we could phrase it the evangelical Christian voters, but it's really in some ways more a social or a cultural conservatism that this body of voters uh, gravitates toward. So we've got kind of mainstream faith. We've got these unaffiliated candidates, uh, Lincoln and Jefferson. We've got the Catholic issue that we've wrestled with and the, the country continues to wrestle with other faiths. And we've got the um, evangelical strain. So Michael's going to talk to us a little bit about how important is faith uh, for the voters when they look at who to vote for? Michael. Thanks. This is um, this here is a recent study that was done by by um, the Pew Center. Um, they do lots of different uh, different research into to policy areas as well as um, just aspects of of life in American society. Um, the one thing that I want to draw your attention to is that. Um, this, this study indicates that 51% of, Ameri of Americans would be less likely to vote for a candidate who does not believe in God. And so there has certainly been a decline in the importance of, of religion um, in, in American electoral politics. Um, but it, it still seems to be a way in which voters are evaluating, evaluating candidates. And so we're going to take a look at what some of the candidates think about uh, about religion, um, their own personal religion, as well as the role of religion um, in American politics. So if we look at Hillary, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton is a Methodist. Um, I think this statement summarizes pretty well um, her perspective, um, at least on the way that faith should, uh, should engage uh, with society. She says, I have always cherished the Methodist church because it gave us the great gift of personal salvation, but also the obligation of social gospel. And that's important. Social gospel is really a term that we saw come into being um, in the late 19th century. There was a growing gap between the rich um, and the poor. Um, and scholars like Walter Rauschenbusch uh, wrote, uh, wrote uh, a lot about um, the role of the social gospel. And it was really a turning away from um, a discussion of personal salvation, personal faith, and a move toward thinking of how religion could be used as a tool um, to solve social problems. And so um, what you've seen over time is the Democratic Party in, 
and instances in which it embraces faith, it very much embraces faith um, from the perspective of this, of this social gospel. Um, and that is also true of, uh, of some of the language that Bernie Sanders uses. Uh, Bernie Sanders would be, if he won uh, the presidency, he would be our first uh, Jewish president. Um, he is a secular Jew. He has talked um, extensively about um, how his Jewish faith is important to his um, identity, but he does not have any particular um, belief in God. What he says is, uh, what I believe in and what my spirituality is, is about uh, that we're all in this together, that I think it is not a good thing to believe that as human beings we can turn our backs on the suffering of other people. So you hear resonating in that, um, you know, kind of this, this same social gospel perspective that, that we have an obligation to help those around us. Um, and you might be asking, you know, well, given, given what I talked about in the first slide, it said 51% of people would be less likely to vote for a candidate um, who... Uh, who does not believe in God. And that is true of Americans in general. Um, but if we look uh, more specifically about Bernie Sanders supporters, so take, for example, young voters. 80% um, of, of young people, according to Pew Center, um, say that they believe in God. Um, the difference with young people is that only 38% uh, of those young people say that it plays an important part in their life. Um, so it is not a way in which they are evaluating society um, in, in the same way that, that older uh, voters are. So, for example, if you look at baby boomers, 59% uh, of baby boomers say that their religious beliefs um, inform in very important ways how they live their lives. That, that just isn't the case uh, for, for younger voters, and that impacts, um, I would argue, the extent to which they are willing to support candidates who don't um, ascribe to any particular uh, religious belief. Um, I'm going to make the argument that something important happened in 2012. Um, and I really think that's the case. Uh, you're free to argue with me. We can use question and answer in the session for you to tell me why I'm wrong. Um, but I think that there, there was a lot of discussion in 2012 about why religion didn't matter more. There were articles such as this one written in the New Republic which talked extensively about um, the declining discussion of religion um, in American elections, particularly in the 2012 election. I think there's a couple reasons why that's true. Um, a, a recent uh, uh, CNN ORC poll, uh, I'll read this here, it says, has found that nearly 30% of all Americans do not believe the president is a Christian, including 43% of Republicans who say he is a Muslim while 20% of all adults believe he was born um, outside of the United States. In 2012, when Gallup asked, do you happen to know the religious faith of Barack Obama, 47% of Republicans claim to have no idea, 43% are now certain he is a Muslim, up from 34% of Republicans who told Pew in 2010 that they believed um, that he was a Muslim. So if we are thinking about, particularly in the Republican Party, um, you know, you could argue that, well, why aren't they more supportive of Obama? Obama is a professed Christian. Um, the, the, the Republican Party is, is filled with evangelical voters. Um, well, the reason they don't align themselves with Barack Obama is that they doubt the, on, the authenticity of his faith. They say, well, he's not one of us. He's actually a Muslim. Or he wasn't born here. And so these arguments um, that he is not part of their group. Um, additionally, um, they were also challenged, I think, in the Republican Party with the fact that Mitt Romney was, um, was a Mormon. And so, uh, so the Mormon faith uh, says that they are, they are a denomination of Christianity, but um, an American election studies poll um, that, that was done in the wake of the 2012 um, election demonstrated that 48.5% of 48.5% uh, of Republicans um, believed that Mormonism was not part of Christianity. Okay. So what you saw, I think, in 2012 was a situation in which evangelical voters on, on the Republican side were faced with a no-win situation. So in the past, historically, they would align themselves with a very religious candidate. On one hand, they had a candidate they believed was a Muslim. And on the other hand, they had a candidate that they didn't believe was Christian. It was part of a sect that some of them would label as even a cult in the evangelical community. And so they were faced with a no-win situation. They had to decide how to vote. And so my argument is that they said, 
Romney is the lesser of two evils here. That at least he represents our position on social issues. And I think that says a lot about what we're seeing in 2016. People are asking, why are evangelical voters voting for Donald Trump? And Mike's going to get to this in a minute. The reason is that I think that there's a movement um, in the evangelical community to say, we're not, we don't care as much about the authenticity of the faith of the canon. What we care more about is who is going to fight for the policies that we care about. And I think there was something really substantial that happened um, in 2012 in that respect. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Mike, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the candidates on the Republican side. Thank you, Michael. So we want to kind of look at uh, Ted Cruz, John Kasich, and Donald Trump. Where are they at in their faith? Uh, what constituencies are they drawing from? So Ted Cruz has made a point of targeting evangelical voters. Um, he uses a lot of very religious language, overtly religious language. You know, at the end of the day, faith is not organized religion. It's, it's not going to a church. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So this is language that resonates with uh, evangelical voters. Now, uh, he's really in competition in many ways for that block of voters with Donald Trump. Uh, and we'll get to Trump in just a minute as, in terms of why evangelical voters are voting for Trump. Uh, Cruz says any president who doesn't begin every day on his knees isn't fit to be commander in chief of this country. So. Cruz has done a lot of good things in terms of his targeting. He's had a good ground game. So for instance, in Iowa, he had a pastor in every county in Iowa supporting him. Um, so he's been very deliberate about it. But Cruz has not risen. Uh, I mean, he's won some states, but not enough. And part of the problem I think that Cruz has is nobody likes him. I mean, he's just not a likable guy. He's very stern. He's unbending. Now, some people like that because they say, we want somebody who's not going to compromise, uh, who's not going to change. And, and so that, that kind of mentality creates problems for governing uh, because governing is about compromise. Um, th there's a, a, a sad statement from uh, Senator Lindsey Graham about Cruz. This is the second Lindsey Graham quote about Cruz. He said, if you killed Ted Cruz on the floor of the Senate and the trial was in the Senate, nobody would convict you. So he's not really well loved by his colleagues. Um, so there, there are these, these angry voters who are concerned that their social agenda hasn't um, gotten implemented, kind of like what happened to Carter, that they were angry with him. He didn't implement their social agenda. Let's look at John Kasich. Um, and, and I think this statement by Kasich is a demonstration of how I think he tries to have his faith inform his policy. Uh, so he was having a conversation with a legislator in 2013 about the expansion of Medicare in Ohio. And the legislator, legislator was saying, hey, I'm really in favor of small government. I want small government. Kasich said, now when you die and get to meeting with St. Peter, he's probably not going to ask you much about what you did on keeping government small. But he is going to ask you what you did for the poor. You better have a good answer. Um, so I think there's somebody who's trying to take uh, his faith seriously and, and drive that into his, his policies. So why are evangelical voters going for Donald Trump? I'll actually show you on the very last slide a, a, a website link to uh, an interview that I did uh, Tuesday of this week with a TV station in Florida about that very question. So if you want to hear more about it, you can look at that. Um, so why are evangelicals going for Trump? Well, because he's leading a very good life. I, I try to live a good life, and I have. Um, he has a little bit of profanity. Um, I have a very great relationship with God, he says. So he says, I'm a Protestant. I'm a Presbyterian, and I go to church, and I love God, and I love my church. 
He's not an active member of church. Um, Pope Francis, you remember, kind of jumped on Trump uh, saying, anybody who says they're for building walls instead of bridges is not Christian. Um, and, and Trump says, I think religion is a wonderful thing. I think my religion is a wonderful thing. Notice the repetition. We talked about rhetoric last time, the repetition. Um, the repetition, but without any specifics, um, which is the same thing on his policy issues. And am I picking on Trump? Yes, I am. And, and I think it's important to do that because this is the front runner for the Republican nomination now, and it, it does raise some serious concerns because this is really unprecedented in American history, a candidate uh, who is this unfiltered um, and who is who, who has so little intellectual curiosity about policy issues. So I think it is important to, to focus on these things. Trump's asked, what's his favorite book? It's the Bible. Does he prefer the Old Testament or the New Testament? Well, probably equal. I, I think it's just incredible. <laughs> what's his favorite Bible verse? I wouldn't want to get into that because to me that's very personal. The Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics. Okay, so, so Trump, my opinion, it, it, is Trump is theologically illiterate. Um, he doesn't know this information. He, he's, he's got a little tagline, he's Presbyterian, but you know, you could say, you know, you'll, you'll know people by their fruits. So uh, there's the, uh, in the New Testament, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. So do any of those apply to Trump? So I mean, I think these are legitimate questions that we need to ask. So has Trump ever asked God for forgiveness? I'm not sure I have. I just go on and try to do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. And then he described communion as my little wine and my little cracker. And it was speaking to Liberty University. He was uh, quoting from the New Testament. He said, two Corinthians, instead of what's typically second Corinthians is what you would say. So there you have the, the, the faith of uh, some of the current candidates. We want to shift gears now away from faith, and we want to talk about policy issues. Um, so I have this picture up here of Adlai Stevenson. He was the uh, Democratic nominee in 1952 and 1956. Um, a very thoughtful, intelligent, gracious man uh, who lost uh, both times to uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And after one speech in 1956, a, uh, a voter came up to him and said, Governor Stevenson, all thinking people are for you. To which Stevenson replied, that's not enough. I need a majority. <laughs> So we want to think um, hard about some policy issues. Now we, um, I'm going to show you a long list of policy issues we developed. Uh, we can't go through all of them or we'd be here till midnight. So we've picked uh, four issues that we're going to talk about uh, and I've circled them, the ones we're going to hit, the Constitution. But you can see some of the others that are out there. We can talk about some of these general issues or some of the entitlement programs, Obamacare or Social Security, Medicare, things like that. We could talk about economic issues, both at a micro level, how does it impact individual people, as well as a macro level, uh, what should our tax structure be like, uh, what's the role and size of the federal government, what do we do about the federal deficit, things like that. And we're not going to touch on any of those. Um, we've got social issues we could address. We are going to talk about immigration. Um, there's actually a very close tie-in on some of these issues related to um, the Constitution. Um, uh, specifically about uh, freedom of religion and immigration and then the foreign policy issue of ISIS and what to do with it. A lot of these kind of merge and blend together. So these are our four issues we're going to talk about. Trump, I, I believe, is um, assaulting the Constitution with some of his statements. So in terms of freedom of religion, he says there's absolutely no choice but to shut down religious institutions, meaning mosques. Um, go back to JFK's speech that an assault against one 
church is an assault against all churches. Um, so that's what the, the, the First Amendment is about. Or also in the First Amendment, Trump says, and, and we talked about rhetoric last time, Trump saying one thing and then saying the opposite. So he says, I love the free press. I think the media is among the most dishonest groups of people I've ever met. They're terrible. So what, what does he really believe? So then it really comes out. He says, one of the things I'm going to do if I win is I'm going to open up our libel laws so that when they write purposely negative and horrible and false articles, we can sue them and win lots of money. So Donald Trump would have loved John Adams. And why do I say that? So during Adams' administration, uh, Congress passed an Adams sign, and it's kind of one of the stains on Adams' legacy. Adams sign was called the Alien and Sedition Acts. And among what those acts did or said is that um, it, it criminalized making false uh, statements that are critical of the federal government. Um, it made it harder for immigrants to become citizens. And it gave the president the power to imprison or deport non-citizens who were dangerous or from a hostile country. So don't tell Donald Trump about the Alien and Sedition Acts because, you know, that's uh, perhaps what he wants to go back to. Fourteenth Amendment guarantees uh, United States citizenship to any uh, baby born in the United States. Uh, Trump says that uh, he interprets the 14th Amendment differently, and he doesn't think that you have to go with that, and he doesn't think you need a constitutional amendment to change that. Um, so these are some big structural issues about kind of how do we govern? We're, we're a nation of laws, and we have a constitution, and, and some concerns there that come up on that. I want to shift gears to immigration. So in the... Uh, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, there was a huge influx of immigrants from Europe, um, a lot of Catholics, a lot of Irish, and um, there was a big backlash then against these people uh, because they were, they were different, and, and what were they going to do, and especially against Catholicism. So Catholicism was called, you know, an ally of tyranny. There was a um, political party that formed out of all of this, a nativist party, um, so just focusing on Americans, not these immigrants. It was called the Know Nothing Party. Um, and that name comes from not the fact that they didn't know anything, although that may be true too, but it, it comes from the fact that it was a very secret party. And so when they were asked things about the party, they were instructed to say, I know nothing. And so that they became known colloquially as the Know Nothing Party. The Know Nothing Party said back then that immigration is the chief source of crime in this country. Donald Trump says tremendous crime is coming across the border. It's the same impulse um, against immigration, this fear. And, and Donald Trump is stirring up the fear. I want to talk about three Republican presidents and their statements about immigration and foreigners and what they had to say. So Abraham Lincoln first, so this was before he became president. He wrote a letter to his good friend. Um, and you can't read that very well there, so you can read it here. So he says, I'm not a know-nothing. That is certain. How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people, Catholics. Our progress in degeneracy seems to me pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings know get control, it will read, all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to that, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty, to Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. That's Abraham Lincoln against uh, the, the Know Nothing Party. Theodore Roosevelt in 1907 said, we should insist that if an immigrant who comes here in good faith becomes an American and assimilates himself to us, 
he shall be treated on an exact equality with everyone else. For it is an outrage to discriminate against any such man because of creed or birthplace or origin. A Republican president saying that, okay? Thirdly, I want to show you a clip from Ronald Reagan. But it is true our borders are out of control. It is also true that this has been a situation on our border back through a number of administrations. And I supported this bill. I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots and who've lived here, even though some time back uh, they may have entered illegally. With regard to the employer sanctions, this we must have that. Not only to ensure that we can identify the illegal aliens, but also, while some keep protesting about what it would do to employers, there is another employer that we shouldn't be so concerned about. And these are employers down through the years who have encouraged the illegal entry into this country because they then hire these individuals and hire them at starvation wages and with none of the benefits that we think are normal and natural for workers in our country and the individuals can't complain because of their illegal status. We don't think that those people should be allowed to continue operating free. And this was why the provisions that we had in with regard to sanctions and so forth. And I'm going to do everything I can, and all of us in the administration are, to join in again when Congress is back at it, to get an immigration bill that will give us once again control of our borders. So Ronald Reagan would never be elected on a Republican ticket today. I believe in amnesty, he said. Wow. So um, Michael, tell us a little bit about what's happening today uh, in terms of the whole immigration issue. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'll give you just uh, a quick overview here over uh, you know some basic questions related to immigration in the United States. First, um, there's a question about what to do uh, with with non-citizens. First, uh, do you grant um, amnesty or citizenship? Um, do you create some sort of guest worker program which allows people who are here um, illegally to to stay here so long as they are working for a business in the United States? Um, do you try to go around and, and deport? Uh, people who are here illegally. Um, how do you think about the border? Um, do you think that we should build a wall, perhaps a wall that Mexico pays for? Or do you simply increase uh, border patrol? Um, and, and what do you do about this current refugee crisis? So um, we hear, you know, certainly some talk about uh, Muslim immigration. Jeb Bush, for example, was talking about how we should only let uh, Syrian Christians in. Um, they asked him, you know, how do you know if a refugee is a Christian? And he said, come on, you know. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure what that means exactly, but apparently we know. Um, I want to talk just uh, quickly to sort of frame this discussion of immigration um, personally about an issue that, that I have had um, with some of the language uh, in this election cycle. So uh, when, when you're teaching at a university, um, there is often a diversity statement that uh, is included, uh, and, and you are required to, uh, to adhere to that um, diversity statement. And here at Puget Sound, for example, it says uh, that we aspire to create respect for and appreciation for uh, of all persons as a key characteristic of our uh, campus community. And I, I firmly believe that's true. That's the way that I try to, uh, to run my classrooms. And also, uh, you know, as someone who teaches political science, I try to present both sides of the issue in as fair a way as I, as I possibly can. Um, what I found in this election is that those two values um, are irreconcilable. That it is impossible um, to, at the same time, present uh, the arguments about immigration fairly and to maintain a commitment to this diversity statement. And I will err, you know, every time uh, on, on the half of diversity. Um, I, I want students to feel included, and I don't think anything else that we do in the classroom matters um, if people feel that they are excluded. Um, and so I have, for the first time, decided that I will just say this 
this is racist. <laughs> um, you know, this is this is bigoted language that we ought to reject. And and I don't think uh, I think that we're all called to do that. I think that we all should do that. Um, it, it, there's there's a lot of things that are particularly problematic, and and I think that there's a lot of talk about how Republicans are responsible for this, but I don't want to let Democrats off the hook um, because they're also responsible. So this was a poll that was done uh, in South Carolina asking people whether or not they supported or opposed the banning of Muslims from entering the United States. Um, what you can see is if you add up those who support the policy as well as those who are still unsure, uh, thirty percent of Democrats fall into one of those two categories. It's a third of Democrats who are not vehemently opposing Donald Trump's suggestion that we ban Muslims. So to assume that this is just a Republican problem I think is false. This is an American problem. This is a problem which is more pervasive than uh, we, typically, uh, we typically talk about it. Um, as we. Um, on the Republican side, uh, 45 percent of um, Republican voters in the South Carolina primary said that they supported the ban on Muslim immigration. Um, and about 10% were, were not sure. That means that about 55% of uh, Republicans in that election either supported or were not sure how they felt about that issue. Uh, you know, as a newsflash, Donald Trump did not get 55% of the vote in South Carolina. So it is not just Donald Trump's voters. It's not just Republicans, and it's not just those who are supporting Donald Trump. Uh, this is the statement that Donald Trump released. Uh, it says, Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on, whatever, whatever that, that means. Um, and, and you've heard some. Some Republican candidates like Ted Cruz say that they reject uh, uh, Trump's ban on Muslim policy, but, but they stand by Trump. They continue to stand by him. This is a statement from Ted Cruz shortly after Trump released his statement. It says, certainly in the media there has been no shortage of criticism for Donald Trump, and I do not believe the world needs my voice added to that chorus of critics, uh, Cruz said Tuesday, highlighting his rival's tough immigration proposals to build a wall along the Mexican border. And listen, I commend Donald Trump for standing up and focusing on America's attention, America's attention on the need to secure our borders. I think Donald Trump has done a good job of focusing the American people's attention on the need to do so. Um, and, and, and you also see that, you know, in the most recent debate. You know, it's it's really easy to talk tough and to say that we reject uh, Donald Trump. We think he's a con man. All of these things, but the candidates still say that if it comes down to a race between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, that they would support Donald Trump. You can't. You can't wholeheartedly reject the ideas that he is presenting and then say that in November you will go and vote for him. Those two things are not compatible uh, with each other. Um, this is um, a woman, Rose Hamid. She's a 56-year-old uh, Muslim woman. She went to a Trump rally and stood silently. Wasn't, wasn't hurting anyone, actually was engaging in friendly conversation with people that were around her. She, her t-shirt says, uh, Salam, I come in peace. Um, her stated goal by going to that rally was to put a human face um, on, on the Muslim faith. She wanted to say, you know, we are not, we are not dangerous. Um, and, and she was engaging in, in good conversation with people. She was um, escorted out of the rally. Um, people began to yell at her um, things like, do you have a bomb, over and over again. And she was escorted from, from that rally. This is a man named uh, William Selly. Um, this is a Facebook post uh, that he had uh, on, his, uh, on his Facebook site. He says that he would follow Donald Trump to the end of the world. Um, this man stood outside of a mosque yelling, I will kill you all. Um, he was arrested uh, recently because they found a pipe bomb in his home. The language that we use matters. Um, you know, this, this is riling up something that is very ugly um, in us. And it's not, it's not funny, and it's not something that we can casually dismiss. Um, this has real this has real consequences. When we think about the broader uh, foreign policy picture, when we think about 
uh, how uh, candidates should approach this question of, of dealing with, with ISIS. Um, what you can see is that there doesn't tend to be uh, much difference with regard to the candidates um, on either party with regard to airstrikes. All of the candidates say that we should continue uh, airstrikes against um, ISIS. If you look uh, with ground troops, there is more of a difference there. Um, most of the Republicans uh, support ground troops, except for Ted Cruz, who says that he opposes the use of ground troops. Um, both Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, and uh, Barack Obama today say that they oppose uh, ground troops. Okay. Um, what I would argue is the difference is not, is not policy here. It's not that much you know, when you, when you talk about uh, when you talk to the candidates about what they would do differently than Obama, you're not getting a lot of really in detail uh, responses. Um, the difference is the language, the rhetoric that we're using to talk about um, how we would fight ISIS. So Marco Rubio, for example, says, "Where we strike them, we capture or kill their leaders. We videotape the operations because." I want the world to see how these ISIS leaders cry like babies and begin to sing like canaries. And Cruz says, if I am elected president, I will direct the Department of Defense to destroy ISIS. I will carpet bomb them into oblivion. I don't know if sand can glow in the dark, but we're going to find out. Uh, and this caused the former head of the Army War College to remark on his ignorance of modern bombing tactics. Donald Trump said, I would be very, fir very, very firm with families. Frankly, that will make people think because they may not care much about their lives, but they do care, believe it or not, about their families' lives. He's backed away from, from that statement. Um, but essentially, you had a leading Republican candidate saying that we should engage in war crimes um, against people in other parts of the world. Um, again, the language that we use matters here. As we try to build coalitions, as we try to have countries work with us on this problem, uh, you know, it is important that we are careful about the way that we talk about the problem. Uh, on the Democratic side, um, I think this, this exchange um, is telling um, with regard to differences on, on foreign policy. So, my argument, oh, not so fast. That's a really cool slide. We're going to wait a second. Um, uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of ISIS on, on the Democratic side, um, I, I think that it's important to understand that there's two ways that voters uh, typically make their decision. You can engage in prospective voting, meaning that you look at the candidate's positions and you say, I think this candidate has better policy positions than this candidate. Um, or you can engage in retrospective voting, meaning that you look at the past performance of the candidate and you use that to predict how they would do in the future. Um, what Bernie Sanders is essentially saying is, yes, there's not that much of a difference between um, Secretary Clinton and myself uh, in terms of what we would do going forward, but you should evaluate her past performance, the fact that she supported um, the Iraq war when I did not. And so that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest distinction in terms of of foreign policy here. Um, Hillary Clinton's argument is essentially um, that, that Bernie Sanders doesn't have the same foreign policy credentials. And so she is also um, asking voters to make a retrospective analysis, saying that Bernie Sanders has not focused on things related to foreign policy, and as a consequence, you should trust my background first. Um, now, on the Democratic side, I think that one of the, the more interesting debates, really cool slot. I wish that was a real movie. Um, um, I think one of the, the really interesting debates is this debate about what to, you know, what to make of the, of, of the current campaign finance system. We talked about that during the first lecture. We talked about some of the problems with modern um, campaign financing. Uh, Bernie Sanders has said, I do not know any progressive who has a super PAC and takes $15 million from Wall Street. So he is arguing that essentially um, you cannot be a progressive as Hillary Clinton claims to be and also have a super PAC where people donate large amounts of money to your campaign. 
Um, and he's also attacked Hillary Clinton in terms of the speeches that she gave um, to, to Wall Street uh, enterprises. And so specifically, he often talks about uh, Goldman Sachs, where Hillary Clinton was paid um, $675,000 uh, um, to, to give speeches there. Um, her argument is that she was, uh, she was paid money um, to go and, and talk about her experience as Secretary of State. Um, Bernie Sanders says uh, $225,000 must be a really awesome speech. And so, uh, you know, essentially it's this ongoing question of the degree to which we think uh, money um, impacts the way that um, the individuals, once they're in office, make decisions. Um, the New York Times uh, has said that Hillary Clinton should release the, the transcripts of those, um, of those speeches that she gave to Wall Street. Hillary Clinton has said that she will not release transcripts um, until uh, every other candidate in the race does. Bernie Sanders uh, doesn't have any, but Republicans, she argues, uh, do have speeches, and she says that it would be a double standard um, if uh, you did not hold all of the candidates in the election to, to the same standard. Um, Hillary Clinton's answer is also uh, also this. We agree that we've got to get unaccountable money out of politics. We agree that Wall Street should never be allowed to wreck Main Street again. But here's the point I want to make tonight. I am not a single issue candidate and I do not believe we live in a single issue country. I think that a lot of what we have to overcome to break down the barriers that are holding people back whether it's poison in the water of the children of Flint, or whether it's the poor miners who are being left out and left behind in coal country, or whether it is any other American today who feels somehow put down and oppressed by racism, by sexism, by discrimination against the LGBT community, against the kind of efforts that need to be made to root out all of these barriers, that's what I want to take on. And here in Wisconsin, I want to reiterate, we've got to stand up for unions and... So essentially, uh, you get the gist of the argument there. What she is saying is that Bernie Sanders is a one-issue candidate, that this uh, focus on campaign finance um, is ignoring other issues which ought to be paid attention to. Um, his argument in reply would be that um, the issue of campaign finance and money is uh, so pervasive that it touches on all of these other issues that it prevents the government from taking action on them. So I think it's a really, uh, I think it's a really interesting debate, uh, especially in light of um, some of the stuff that we talked about in the first lecture and the recent uh, Supreme Court decisions. Um, in order to, to help you remember some of these trends, I decided to pull out a couple of um, songs that are verses from songs that I think will help you understand the positions. You have Hillary Clinton here who, uh, I, I'm taking a quote from a Macklemore song, uh, Make the Money, who says, Make the money, don't let the money change you. Change the game, don't let the game change you. I'll forever remain faithful, all my people stay true. Essentially saying that, you know, I'm, I, I can take money and it isn't going to change the way in which I uh, target banks and business interests uh, in the United States. And then Bernie Sanders might, uh, might reflect uh, what the OJs uh, say in For the Love of Money. Um, I know money is the root of all evil. Do funny things to some people. Give me a nickel. Brother, can you spare a dime? Money can drive some people out of their minds. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. I was trying to think of a way to end this without just. Uh, <laughs> I was I, I was gonna sing, but uh, I like it when you all come back. So the end. <laughs> uh, so tonight. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you don't have to stop clapping. That's okay. Um, so we're happy to take uh, we're happy to take your questions now. Any questions? Yes. And I'm going to repeat the questions so that everybody can can hear those. Michael, can you flip the slide one more? Mm. This might sound like a silly question, but why do the Democrats have so many more delegates than the Republicans? So the question is, why do the Democrats have so many more delegates than the Republicans? It's about double, it looks like. Yeah. Um, you know, each party has their own set of rules. 
um, and, and then within each party, each state has their own set of rules. So it's just the way they, I, I don't know the historical development of it, but. Um, Okay. That's where the superdelegates came from. Yeah. Right. So there's about 750 exactly. superdelegates that are, are there to kind of preserve the establishment. Uh, so McGovern going down in 1972, that's what caused them to have some reforms and to institute the superdelegates. Uh, Michael, do you have any reflection no, on that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Other questions? Yes. So the question is, why do I think John Kasich has had such a hard time getting his message recognized and heard? Y you know, I think part of it is uh, just the year that it is he's running in, um, because th there are a lot of very shrill voices, uh, very um, loud voices, and, and, and Kasich has not done that. He has tried to be somewhat rational on things. Um, but, 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 you know, you... you You've got Donald Trump, who's the ultimate showman and entertainer. Uh, Cruz and Rubio, very, um, very harsh, very inflammatory language, and, and that is not playing well in a year where uh, the voters are angry. And I, I mean, it's playing well with a certain constituency, but uh, large segments of the voters are angry, like we talked about earlier, because of the gridlock in Washington. So good, good question, fair question. Now at this point, um, I mean, I've seen some polls that talk about uh, Kasich being ahead in Ohio or neck and neck or just a few points behind Trump. So that's going to be a make or break state for John Kasich. And he has actually said if he does not win Ohio, he's going to drop out of the race. Yes. So kind of your reflections on, you know, how, how do you deal with a bully? Um, so, so, so Kasich has not fared well on the debate stages because, um, you know, there's all this yelling over one another. Um, and, and how's that going to play out if it's a, a campaign between Trump and Hillary Clinton? Um, I mean, it'll be very interesting. And at this point, if we had to predict today, who the nominees are going to be, that's who we'd probably say. Um, you know, not dealing with the unpredictability of a potential brokered Republican convention. Um, yeah, cool. I mean, I think that uh, if you think about a general election race between the two of them, um, I think that you see, uh, I think you see Clinton's campaign um, spend a lot more time than Republicans have, that they're sort of getting to this right now on, on his business record. Um, and and um, you know how it's not as uh, it's not as great as he, he makes it out to be, um, and so I think you'll see a lot of time spent on that. But I, I will tell you, it is going to be a nasty election. So you'll have Donald Trump who will relitigate every uh, every whisper about the Clintons um, in the last thirty years, and you will have um, a lot of attacks on Donald Trump's. Uh, personal life and his business dealings, and I think that it is going to be, uh, I, I think it's going to be pretty nasty. I, I talked, uh, I don't know if it was last lecture or the first lecture, about the 1912 election and kind of the nastiness of that election. That's tame compared to what we're seeing now and what we're going to see, I think. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, in the back up there.
Yeah, so the, the comment and question relates to the fact, so if a Democrat is elected in November and we have a Republican Congress, uh, is that going to be just a repeat of the last seven years where you've got a divided government like that? Um, yeah, that's a risk. Now, you know, there's a lot of speculation that if uh, Donald Trump is the nominee, that he's actually uh, not going to have coattails and he's going to bring down some uh, candidates uh, for governors, uh, for senators, and representatives. So uh, potentially uh, the Senate at least has, has a better chance of uh, shifting to Democratic control. The House uh, it would be harder, I think, to, to have Democratic control there. But yeah, good, good observation. Jack. that teachers or people in regular jobs are not allowed to say how oh, these kind of people get fired. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and somebody asked me why the presidential candidates are allowed to say this. I guess there isn't really somebody who would check them. Is there, is there an influence that ought to suppress the kind of so, so the question relates to you know some of the the false and misleading statements that are are, are spoken, and you know what happens with those, and, and uh, I'm going to ask Michael to comment on this in, in just a second. But part of what happens is they don't think they're going to they get their message out, even if there's a fact checker uh, that's kind of not uh, picked up on. Yeah, I mean the the best check on on things like that is is the voters, um, and, and they haven't been doing a very good job so far. Um, and, you know, you've seen attacks from other places just not work. I mean, the media covers him a lot, and when he says something outrageous, they do hold him accountable for it. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't work because he just says, look at the media, you know, at the rallies. He, he points them out and he mocks them. And um, the people that are at the rallies turn around and they mock the reporters who are there. So there's a distrust of the media. When people in the establishment speak out against Donald Trump, it's you know further proof that he is independent from them, that he uh, is someone who isn't um, who isn't uh, owned by the establishment. And so um, some of these more traditional ways don't seem to be don't seem to be working. Um, and, and like I said, the best option is for people to um, to vote. And, and there's a lot of people. I mean, we, we don't know what's going to happen in November, but you know, there's a lot of Republicans who are not voting for Trump. So Trump is getting 30, 35, 40. Maybe in Massachusetts, he was a little bit above 40 percent, maybe 45 percent. But that was the high. And so there's a lot of Republicans who are not voting for Donald Trump and who have in fact said, there's no way I'll vote for Trump, but they're gonna be in a difficult position. Do they vote, do they not vote at all? Do they vote for Clinton? If there's a third party or independent candidate, do they go there? Uh, what does that do in terms of the turnout um, in November? Uh, is Trump going to, to get a lot of Democrats out because of the concern about Trump becoming president? So a lot of interrelated issues. Yes. So the question relates to, um, historically, how much have the voters really cared about the candidate's faith um, or, or, or lack of faith? Um, I mean, you could go back to 1800, which I told you about with Jefferson. So that was a big issue for some people. You know, he's, he's a howling atheist. Uh, he's an infidel. Um, so that became an issue. Um, but I think if you look for a lot of the elections, no, it, it has not been um, something that's been raised. Uh, I think that started probably in 1970, well, 1960 with Kennedy, 1976 with Carter, the year of the evangelical, and, and then ever since then it has been elevated as an issue, I think. But I, I think you're right, in the past we, we haven't seen as much probably. 
Yes. Yeah, so the question is, have, has there been uh, any other outsider candidates who have ended up winning the presidency and what kind of president did they become? Um, Trump would be the most outsider of, of anybody. Um, you know, we, we've had a, a handful of candidates who have not had political positions before. They've been military leaders or appointed officials. But the um, vast majority have been elected officials or in the early days of the republic. They were, uh, you know, part of the Constitutional Convention, things like that. So they were politicians. Um, you could take, um, uh, and we talked about this a little bit last time, I think, but you could take an example of William Howard Taft, great, great resume of appointed offices, you know, Governor General of the Philippines, uh, Solicitor General before the Supreme Court, Secretary of War under Theodore Roosevelt, great, great resume. He becomes president. He's a total failure as president um, because not that he didn't have the connections or anything, but it was more that just personality-wise he didn't fit. Um, so again, I, I think we are seeing an election with uh, the Republican front runner. I mean, this is really unprecedented. There's not a lot that we can go back and look at um, in terms of direct parallels. I think. Yes, Barb. Yeah, so, so, so Barb's question relates to uh, kind of endorsements that uh, various uh, former candidates are making. So Chris Christie uh, standing behind Donald Trump and, and uh, endorsing him, uh, standing very uncomfortably, as you said, behind the podium, so much so that Christie had to go hold a news conference saying, no, I was not being held hostage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and what kind of deals are being made? I, I don't know. I mean, I think Chris Christie would love to be vice president or attorney general. Uh, ben Carson is supposed to endorse Trump um, tomorrow. Um, he, he already did it today. Okay. Um, Carly Fiorina uh, endorsed Ted Cruz. Uh, so what kind of deals are being made? I, I, I suspect there are some conversations going on. Um, yeah. But I don't know what those are going to be. Yeah. So the question relates to uh, the, the tone of the debates that we've seen, and are we going to end up seeing in the general election debates uh, a different style, and uh, them not talking over one another as much? And um, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that the problem is the format. Um, and so, <laughs> so I think you could create, I think you could create the most fair, the most balanced format possible. And what you saw happen in the last Republican debate, or what is happening right now as we speak, I'm not, we're not watching it, but... We're uh, missing the great know. show, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I don't think, I think you would see, I think you would see the same thing. And, um, and I do think that that's unfortunate. As somebody who uh, coaches debate, um, that is certainly not the type of debate that I teach my students how to, uh, how to pursue, so... Um, and I think that it's a real, I think the last debate was a real embarrassment. I think that uh, the, the types of things that were talked about were really uncomfortable. I think, I think um, you know, we should be able to have young children watch debates and teach them about politics. Um, you know, I don't think that, uh, you know, debate should start airing after 11 o'clock at night or something. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sympathize with you. I'm not sure... Uh, I, I'm not sure what you could do to stop it, though. Yes? Are you going to be having a get-together next Tuesday? <laughs> ah, are we going to be having a get-together next Tuesday? We don't have anything scheduled right now. No. Um, we're, we're scheduled to be somewhere. 
Oh, yes, right. We're already, we're already <laughs> going to go back. So, no, we will not be there. So, you're on your own. That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> yes. Okay, the question relates to, uh, so it's clear that Trump is very anti-Muslim, but is there any anti-Semitic um, impulses against Bernie Sanders? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. It's a question that I don't, at this point, have, have an answer to. Um, I'd be interested to look and see if anybody has, uh, has any data about that. If I look back at, it might be in the Pew Center poll, um, I mean, while, while, while you're looking, just a, yeah. a quick comment that I, I think that uh, we're seeing that religion is much less important now um, to many uh, voters. So I'm not sure that that would end up being an issue. It really hasn't come up much about Sanders' Jewishness. Um, so, so if you look at question. the Pew Center poll that I was, I was uh, showing earlier, 80% of American adults say that it wouldn't matter. 10% um, say that it would make them less likely to support the candidate, and 8% of people say that it would make them more likely to support. So, so there's just difference. as many people uh, that say that it would uh, that it would help as say that it would uh, push them away from a candidate. Yes. So, um, you mentioned that the election cycle this time is a lot about like hatred. But we've only talked about the Republican hatred so far. What are Democrats angry about? So the question relates to, we've talked about uh, a lot of the Republican hatred that we're seeing, and, and, and what are uh, Democrats worried about hating? Wall Street. They, they talk a lot about Wall Street and, um, and big uh, financial jobs. institutions. Yeah. What was that? Jobs. Jobs, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so the focus is on is on those. I think that's where you're seeing the most uh, the most anger um, right now, um, th at least that I can isolate. I'm not sure if you know. Yeah. Oh, I think that's good. Yeah. Uh, Climate change. Uh, yeah. Okay, who am I going to go with? Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so the question relates to the evangelical voters, and is it a big part of the uh, of this election of the of the population, and is that the same as the Tea Party? Um, th there's a a big overlap, I would think, between evangelical voters and the Tea Party. Um, I don't know that it always lines up exactly, um, but yeah, that's a big part of it. How, Michael, are you aware of any data that talks about? Uh, percent of the population if you run across anything? Um, the percent that there's a crossover there? Well, of just evangelical voters. Yeah, uh, I don't have that information in front of me. So what you would see is that um, evangelical voters would be especially powerful in Republican primaries. Um, so these are uh, sort of very, the, the, the most conservative uh, of the Republicans and they turn out to vote. Um, and especially in southern states, can, can tip the balance in favor of one candidate or another. Now, the vote has been split between Donald Trump and, and Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz was anticipating getting the majority of that vote. That's really the sort of crux of his campaign. That hasn't uh, happened to the extent that he hoped it would, which is why he's not meeting um, why he's not meeting the delegate projections. I don't know the exact percentage of the Republican Party. Part of it is that um, the term evangelical is a little bit squishy. It doesn't, um, it's, it's people that, that self-identify as evangelical, but we don't have a real great definition of what that means and what that all encompasses. Uh, so um, typically we, we conflate the term evangelical with just religious conservatives, just people that are religious and conser very conservative politically. Um, and so I don't have the numbers, but but yeah, that's a good question. Jim. Did you plan and if not, would you consider squeezing in a short discussion on potential vice presidential candidates? So the question is, would we uh, consider talking about potential vice presidential candidates? Uh, yes, we'll, we'll talk about, that's a great, great question. We'll talk about that in one of the future. Um, 
lectures. Uh, I mean, I've got some ideas right now of you know some things, people who have been talked about. But as we get further down the cycle, we'll know a little bit more, perhaps. So yes, we'll bring that up. Yes. So the question relates to if Trump is nominated, are we headed to a 1964 uh, Goldwater wipeout uh, at the hands of Lyndon Johnson? I don't think necessarily so. Um, Trump is uh, pulling together angry people. He's pulling together a lot of people who are called the Reagan Democrats, so the coalition that Reagan put together. So. It's not just Republicans, so there's a lot of uh, white working class people who are Democrats that are going toward Trump. So a little bit unclear how that's going to work out. Now, uh, next session on March 24th, we are going to look at the voters. We're going to look at the Electoral College and the states, and we'll try to uh, look at that a little bit more and make some projections. We have time for one Yeah, let, let's take. Yeah. Uh, Take two more questions, oh, sure. and then then we'll uh, oh, sure. we'll, we'll cut it off. Yes, up in the back. So the comment relates to um, kind of the unpredictable nature of the debates and uh, with uh, the, the candidates that we have right now and the role of the moderator being critical in kind of controlling that conversation. Some have done a better job than others have done. Uh, yes? So the comment is a, a good comment, good observation about what is the image of the United States uh, with the rest of the world? And I mean, I've had some communications with people in other countries about this, and they say, what's going on there? <laughs> you know, and, 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 and many of us are appalled as well. So we've gone a little bit over. I do want to point out, if you are interested, I mentioned earlier on uh, this WHDT World News, there's a, uh, an interview that I did on Trump and evangelicals. There was also an interview in the Wall Street Journal where I talked about the age of presidential candidates and how that uh, is important or not. Come Thank you all weeks. for coming. <laughs> Come back March 24th. <laughs>